Well, good morning. It's Wednesday morning. That means we're in the histories again, and it's the last Wednesday uh, of the devotional series for this year. We're going to be picking them back up again in February next year. Um, and during January might be a good time either to catch up on things we may have missed, uh, or perhaps to be able to continue to read through and reflect upon what God is saying to us through his word, keeping in mind that one of the things that Wednesdays have had us focusing on is the fact that God's word is telling us about real things that happen to real people in real times, which incidentally has been our theme for Christmas this year, uh, that the God who steps into real space and time uh, as a real baby who lives a real life, who dies on a, a real cross for real people. Um, but for now, let's think about the reality of David's kingship because it's all about to draw to a close. These are the last chapters, the last words of David. In fact, we get the title at the beginning of chapter 23 telling us these are David's last words as he writes a psalm reflecting upon his life and his ministry and his kingship. And then as we mentioned last week, we have what are really strange chapters recording different things that are taking place throughout David's life as he reflects back at uh, various times. Um, interspersed with poems and then battle reports, you then get these lists of the fighting men that are serving for David. And there's an enormous amount that is happening in these chapters. You may have picked out some of those things. It's interesting, isn't it, that at the end of chapter 23, you have the list of names that are given and the very last name that you are shown and reminded of in verse 39 of chapter 23 is that Uriah the Hittite was listed among David's mighty men. Uriah, you remember, is Bathsheba's husband who was murdered by David in order to cover up his sin. So for all of the wonderful exploits of David, we're reminded again and again of his failures as well. And in fact, that's the way this story will finish for us. Um, again, we're going to see David acting in a way that he ought not to have done. And it echoes back to the very things that kings uh, were not to do, we see David doing. And in fact, he enrolls all of these fighting men and you see all of his achievements, they're listed. But he then sets about counting his fighting men and listing them. And that might not strike you as a terribly bad thing to do. It might be wise, but it's only wise if you think you've got to weigh the odds and work out how you're going to win and strategize. Whereas David, as God's king, should have been reliant upon God for the victories, not whether or not he had the right amount of people to set out into battle. And David wakes up to this problem. So in verse 10, we read this, that David was conscience stricken after he had counted the fighting men. And he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. Interesting, isn't it? He he. he pleads with God for God to take away his sin because he recognizes the consequences of what he's done. Here is an act of pride uh, operating, thinking that David is going to be strong enough. And yet now we see that he's not even strong enough to deal with his sin. Um, David isn't the king that actually can bring about uh, the restoration when sin takes hold. But of course, as we've seen as we've moved through, we do know the king who ultimately does have that kind of power. But of course, God will meter out his justice and David won't be able to take that justice upon himself. And in fact, we see the great tragedy, a plague that is sent and 70,000 people die in that plague. But it's interesting in that space what David comes to acknowledge. In verse 14, he says, I'm in deep distress. Let us fall into the hands of the Lord for his mercy is great and do not let me fall into human hands. David is recognizing a great truth about God, his mercy and also his justice and far better to live in God's mercy and his justice. And yet that justice looks so brutal. But as you come to see what happens at the end of this chapter, we see something about David and his heart. We've been reminded about the fact that David is the one whose heart is after God's. And for all of the wonderful things you can say about David, you also know to be him to be a sinner in need of salvation. And where does salvation come? It comes through the shedding of blood. And that's what we find as, one, as 2 Samuel comes to an end, is that David will establish a place where God can be appeased, where sacrifice can be made. 
and, and actually, interestingly enough, where is that going to take place? Well, it's in this certain field of a Jebusite. And when you realize where that is, this is in the very site of where the temple will be built. And David is going to purchase that piece of property. And what's interesting in all of this is that uh, as the king, he could have demanded it and he certainly offered it for free in this chapter, but he will not take it for free. And why not? Well, because in verse 24 of chapter 24, we read this. The king replies, no, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. And so David brought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. And David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered his prayer on behalf of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. The, the story of David, of 2 Samuel, will finish with this act of sacrifice. But notice what David is saying. He will not bring sacrifices that cost him nothing. And I think that's the right place for us to have, perhaps pause this year as we think about what we bring to God and what we offer him. Um, do we offer God our lives or what costs us nothing for him to bring? Or is it a costly sacrifice? Do we recognize what God is offering for us and what it might be for us to actually respond with all of ourselves? And David here gives us a picture of that. And so as we move into this Christmas period and think about the child that was born into that real situation and died for real human beings who had real sin, like David and like you, like me, um, do we bring real sacrifice or things that actually don't cost us anything? As we bring our lives as a gift, um, overflowing with thanks, because we know that we're not purchasing God's salvation, but here is a response, an outflow of the heart do we bring things that are costly to him? It's meaningful, isn't it? This thought of gift giving and giving something that costs you nothing. Well, that's easy. But what if you were to give something that is valuable? And as we think about our lives in sacrifice and in service to God, what might it look like for us to bring a sacrifice that doesn't cost us nothing, but in fact is actually a demonstration of an overflow of our heart? Let's pray to God this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your incredible sacrifice. We thank you that you know us and our great need, just like you knew David. And Lord, you had made a way for sin to be dealt with through the death of your ultimate and perfect King. And we thank you that this picture of sacrifice there on that temple mount, before the temple was even built, an opportunity for sin to be appeased and for you to relent from your judgment. We thank you that gives us a picture of what you are like when you send your son that costly sacrifice where his blood is poured out for us so that we might get what we do not deserve. So great is your mercy and so lavish is your grace and so wonderful is your justice. Though as we come to Christmas this year, we ask, Lord, that our hearts would be overflowing with love and adoration and awe for you such that we might bring our lives a sacrifice to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.